Welcome to Natural Habitat Adventures, Daily Dose of Nature. I'm your host, Sunny Vanderstar. Today's topic is travel portraiture, tips for capturing the human element. And it will be presented by our fabulous NatHab expedition leader, Julia Champini. Julia, thank you so much for being here today. That first image on the screen is absolutely stunning. I cannot wait to see what else you have in store for us today. So let's go ahead and dive in. Thank you so much, Sunny. I really appreciate it. And thank you to everyone who is joining me on your lunch hour. Uh, so I'll be talking today about the human element travel photography and how absolutely enriching uh, it can be. One second. So just to introduce myself, my name is Julia Champini. I've been a professional photographer for about 15 years, a teacher of photography for 10 years, and an expedition guide for five. Uh, with NatHab, I often guide in Churchill, whether it's polar bears, belugas, or northern lights, uh, but I have guided in about 30 different countries. And this is really amazing because it's given me a chance to photograph uh, so many people in, in their unique environments. Uh, I am an Ontario certified teacher. I have a Bachelor of uh, science in biological sciences, a master of science in education, and a master's of fine arts in documentary film and photography. And for 15 or so years, I worked as a wedding and portrait photographer. Uh, so coming to this presentation or going and traveling, photographing people is something I, I'm often drawn to. I really enjoy that part of the experience, uh, even though wildlife and the biological side is also very important to me. When I work as, a, as a, a portrait photographer, I'm often looking for very authentic and real moments, moments where people maybe have their guard down and they're showing and expressing uh, who they are. It's great to get posed pictures and those serve their own purpose, but I think as you dive deeper into portraiture, when you can connect to someone when their guard is down, your images are gonna be so much more powerful and so much stronger as a result. So I'm always, always looking for those unguarded moments, and I'm also doing whatever I can do to help those moments occur. So I also do a lot of family portraiture, boudoir photography, kind of anything to do with people I, I really, really enjoy. And you'll see from these images, um, one thing that I, I always try to stress is that no one image should look the same as another. If you're telling the story of a family or if you're telling the story of a place, aiming for that visual variety is something you should strive for. That will make a, a whole story come together when you look at all the images, but it will make um, your images more interesting just right off the bat. So um, travel, and portraiture really go hand in hand. And I know NatHab is an incredible company uh, that brings you close to wildlife experiences and that brings you close to uh, nature experiences, but it also brings you close to that human experience. Um, and in my work in Churchill, you have these incredible moments eye to eye with uh, apex predators, the, the polar bears or Arctic fox or red fox. You have these really incredible moments with wildlife around you but there's also so many interesting people you could shoot while you're on expedition while you're doing this so looking around you and seeing uh say the polar bear guides or when you're doing your dog sledding adventure um kind of hearing about the history and the unique culture of that place and photographing the people that live in churchill and work and live off the land it, it adds so much more to your photographs um, as a guide, I'm always looking for interesting moments where the guests are, are coming to life, where they've had a great experience, where they're really engaged with what they're doing. So whether it's to a couple connecting because they've just had a great experience or a photographer, you know, deep in that moment where they're capturing something or a guest seeing their very, very first polar bear and that big, bright smile, I'm always searching for those moments. So it's not only about the, the wildlife and the natural experiences that you can have, it's really looking around you and seeing what kind of human experiences you can capture. And on any of the expeditions that you go on, you meet really interesting people, you meet interesting drivers, you meet interesting guides, you meet uh, interesting guests. 
uh, locals from the community. There are so many people that you can connect to, and I would very much encourage you to connect to everyone around you because you'll learn so much more about the location by doing so. And you'll also feel much more connected to place as a result. So um, we're gonna dive in today. We're gonna talk a bit about portraiture. Um, at first, I wanna talk about maybe the less about the technique and more about the ideas of portraiture. And then we'll talk a little bit more about technique and technical sides. Uh, please feel free to ask me any questions. I really love this topic uh, and there is no, no question I, I'm not excited to hear. So one of the first things uh, when you're traveling and doing photography, uh, especially with portraiture, is uh, starting to recognize universals. No matter where you go, no matter what experience you're about to have, there are human universal things that happen to every single human, no matter where you are. Um, and these commonalities might might be how people create food, what food they're eating, how they practice faith, their connections, their relationships with others, how they show care and love, uh, where they live, transportation, how they get around, work, how they experience pleasure, art, music, dance, and visuals, and you know the different stages of our life. We all go through these different they all go through these similar things and how they play out in different places is beautiful fodder for, for photography. So if I don't know what to shoot, I'll often come back to these universals and I'll, I'll look at how does this person in this place demonstrate um, connection? How does this person in this place cook? It's telling me a lot about the place that I'm in. So I always have these kind of universals in the back of my mind. So uh, how do people connect to the people around them? Uh, interesting little side note, when I photograph couples, if I ask two people to hold hands, every single couple will do so differently. Uh, so how people come together for photographs is a really interesting little tell. So how people, um, move around their cities or move around their worlds, whether on a motorbike or um, tuk-tuks or different vehicles, how do people get around? And capturing that that motion as people are, are traveling, no matter where you are, you can look around and see really interesting moments. A man smoking a cigar in Italy as he's zooming by um, and then choosing to showcase this motion by panning, you know, uh, looking around for all the different ways in which people get around and how can you show that motion. I always like when I'm traveling to, to look at how people are making a living, look at how people uh, provide for their own families and you see such a variety of ways. Uh, and just looking at those differences between people create really interesting photo stories or photo moments. Festivals, shows, and performative art, they differ from culture to culture, but every single culture has these things. Uh, and so taking extra effort or taking extra time to find festivals or shows or art as you travel will really lead to some incredible photo experiences. And you don't even have to travel far. You could do this with your own city and your own culture, looking at the local newspaper to find out what festivals are in your area or what shows or performances are close by will give you a lot of great practice for when you are going to travel to more exotic locations. Uh, and as I mentioned, uh, every, every culture makes art. Every culture has craftsmen and artisans, often who are very proud of what they do. Uh, and spend incredible time and detail in doing what they're doing. And so um, taking a moment and uh, asking someone, can you photograph their art? Can you, can you talk to them for a little bit about what they're doing? Really adds to the experience that you're having. So um, on my most recent expedition, I was in uh, Panama, Colombia and Costa Rica. And then there was a moment where we went to a small village um, and had a chance to kind of get to know uh, this village. It was a very short, brief trip, but one of the photographers there, her name is Jennifer Davison, she had developed a really beautiful relationship with 
this particular island and with the people of this island. And one thing that she did that I, I for never for forever will do uh, is she would bring portraits that she had taken of the people back to them the next time she visited that island uh, as a gift, as a way to say thank you for for allowing me to take your portrait. And so she started to develop this uh, long term relationship with these people. And I absolutely love that. Um, so if you think you're going to be in a place that you've been before and you do ask someone to take their portrait, uh, you can bring back that portrait to them. And it's such a really wonderful uh, seeing how much that portrait can um, affect someone and how appreciative they can be. They have given something of themselves to you and it's it's really kind to be able to give something back. So I really credit uh, Jennifer for this idea. She prints them out into these little uh, three by five cards uh, and she when she was traveling I was traveling with her this whole time she had envelopes and whatever location she had been to and she knew she photographed people she'd have these stacks of images that she would then find the people or find someone who might know these people and return uh, a thank you to them you can also get those little printers that print on site uh, but I think this is a just a really nice touch so looking for the ways uh, with street photography, the ways in which people, um, you know, absorb themselves in a particular moment when they're so caught up in what they're doing. I think that is more than anything what makes a beautiful portrait. And though these grates behind this man in the right hand side drive me nuts, I think they're awful. Um, I really love how these uh, bubbles kind of lead you from the left side into the frame closer and closer to him. The out of focus in the front and then closer and closer to him, the, uh, the bubbles get more in focus and then you're drawn to the man doing this, this task. And so looking for the ways in which people play in their environment, the way in which they express joy, they express pleasure, these are all great things that you can uh, photograph. And uh, children and ch photographing children is a little bit more tricky um however they are such wonderful subject matters uh, i think more than any person alive a child can be present in a moment and i think more than anything that's um one of the most beautiful things you can capture so this small child uh in a in a store in italy i believe uh picking up this little um, ballerina box and just watching it and she was so absorbed in this moment. How can you not want to connect to that? And so I was in Colombia recently for a program and I saw this small styrofoam container with two sticks and two shoes. And it was a, a curiosity. Uh, and uh, often with curiosities, you want to sit and you want to watch and you want to understand what's going on. And so I just sat there with a, with a group. And then there was this little child and he came and he used this styrofoam uh, box as a boat. And then he started to take the stick and paddle himself around this beautiful beach bay. Um, and it's just that magic of childhood. You know, you sit and you watch and now you're, you're so much more connected to a place because you've spent that time. And then the child brought his friends and they were playing, you know, full, full denim, denim top, denim bottom uh, throughout the water. And they asked me in Spanish, uh, um, a number of things that I didn't understand and then quite quizzically looked at me as as though why don't you understand what I was saying but I think they were asking me to play um, so it's this this really sweet element of childhood so I think if you're going to photograph people being bold and being courageous is one of uh, the most important things to do um, it can often be intimidating to to go up to a a stranger, someone you've never met, who speaks another language and asks them for a portrait. Um, but I think if you approach them with a good, a good heart and a lot of kindness, most often people will be willing to be photographed. And if they're not, they're not your subject and that's okay. Uh, so being willing to ask someone for their portrait um, and taking that two seconds of bravery, uh, engaging in conversations, uh, you know, this was a very, very short passing moment in Malta, and I loved just how these two were interacting. Just a quick walk by, you guys look amazing, can I take your portrait? And they laughed, and they let me take their portrait. Um, I love the little details, the handwritten 63 on the top of the house, and the 
the iron wrought a nice house. Uh, it's just really kind of nice. Um, and so asking for permission and, and really you won't get what you don't ask for. And, and this is a perfect example. Um, there was one wedding I photographed and uh, the bride and groom and their bridal party had just had an ice cream break. And I saw um, a school bus full of cheerleaders and all the cheerleaders were in the school bus. And I jumped on the bus and I said, you know, this is their, these guys' wedding day. Would you guys mind coming out and doing something interesting, something big, something fun behind them? And we'll just do a quick picture. And all these young cheerleaders came off the bus. They got in formation, did some great cheers, and we got a unique picture. Um, and so this wouldn't have happened if I didn't ask. And this is one of the bride and groom's favorite pictures from the day because it was just this, you know, spontaneous uh, moment of of bravery and oftentimes just asking you think great things come from it uh, so five tips for approaching people uh, i often go in with the camera down i try to have a conversation um, try to make any observations if you can observe quirks or gestures or glances or the you know the small fine details that people have about them those will then guide how you shoot those people but taking that moment to have a conversation with someone will really you know let down that guard and make people feel a little bit more comfortable and kind of understand your intention i love the in-between moments um, asking people to pose for pictures or uh, you know a person's um, People will often have that performative element. You know, if you're getting your picture taken, you'll smile, you'll pose, you'll you'll have this this barrier. Uh, but if you can catch people in between moments, uh, it it will lead for much more authentic images. So sometimes I'll you know pull my camera down and and fiddle with my dials, even though I'm I'm quite comfortable with them, uh, and that that will give a little bit of okay, we're not shooting now, and and maybe I'll take the shot then, or we'll engage in conversation and I'll take shots during that conversation. And so you might have to take a few more shots than you would for a post shot, but you're more likely to get something that really is a, a, a true moment. Uh, anytime I'm shooting a subject, no matter what, I will give a lot of positive feedback and I'll talk. Uh, this helps kind of get someone out of their own mind and make for a more comfortable environment. Uh, so as simple as you know this looks amazing great job i had a, a friend do a shoot and she was the model and uh, the photographer he would look at the camera and say no 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 this isn't isn't good no and she she said she felt so self-conscious after that experience um that it, it just ruined the whole thing for her so the more positive you can be the more um supportive you can be the more likely someone's gonna be at ease in your presence and kind of um, give you something special and it never hurts to practice with friends and family uh, or or those you are particularly comfortable with um, you can go and say you know i'm, I'm trying to learn this technique or uh, this is a, this is an image that I love. Can can we practice it? Uh, and the people closest to you will often want to support you in your endeavors. And so, practicing with them to get those techniques, it's always a great idea. And one thing I've always done, uh, and I encourage all photographers to do, is study images from your favorite photographers. Uh, as you come across images that really speak to who you are and, and really inspire you, put those aside and study what is it about those image that you connect to? Is it the light? Is it the composition? Uh, is it, you know, a particular moment in time? What is it? And then, and draw from that. Uh, so I'll talk very briefly about uh, getting down to the essence of a portrait and why that might be a useful thing. So a quick scene in uh, Japan, uh, there are about maybe 70, a hundred people around me uh, in this um, this small um, area where people are are engaging in a, a small ceremonial practice. And to me, this picture is behind the scenes. It's quite messy. It's it's chaotic. But you have to, as you're shooting, really hone into the essence of the picture. And to me, obviously, it's this woman with her daughter uh, dressed in these beautiful 
uh, clothing, but the woman is teaching her daughter how to how to do this. And so you're honing in on these two. And this this project uh, this picture is getting closer to the essence of the message, but I think it's really about passing on tra uh, traditions and passing on uh, this connection. So as these two come closer together, we're getting a little bit closer to the essence of this shot. And coming back out, I think um, seeing the girl do it on her own is lovely. But as I as I mentioned before, it's this picture. The essence of it is these two together, mother and daughter, um, passing down this tra tradition. And so you're kind of going through all these different versions of this picture until you get to the heart of what the picture should be. And you likely won't get to, you know, your end shot or your great shot at, unless you go through all the different renditions. Um, so uh, sometimes people think, oh, I failed this image, I failed this image, I failed this image. It's not at all like that. You are taking all these images to get to your final image. Uh, so another example in Japan, um, there's this uh, interesting, I got off the bus and uh, I found a piece of paper that said, you know, there's this ceremony, it's happening in 25 minutes. If you can get yourself there, it should be interesting. So I, I went there um, and it's this very crowded, packed area. Um, I forgot the name of the ceremony at the moment. You'll have to excuse that. But um, essentially they're, they're doing, um, they're parading around this a paper mache dragon. I think it was a, a dragon, Red Dragon Festival or something along those lines. And you have all these different tourists with their phones and everywhere you go, you're looking around and trying to get, you know, a good view of what's going on. Um, but there's so many people around you and that's often something you're fighting with as a travel photographer. Uh, so you look around you and there's hundreds of people with these cameras uh, up to their eyes. And you, you're trying to think, how can I make a beautiful image in, in this chaotic scene, in these chaotic moments? How can I pull it to, down to its essence? And I think that's where a longer lens and an eye for particular people, kind of zooming in and seeing who in the frame is most interesting and most engaging and how you can zone in on, on smaller details. So yes, the big picture is really important, but how can we how can we tell these stories with our characters? And so pulling into the people, uh, you know, not not being so far back, but coming closer to the action uh, is a great way to kind of uh, capture more interesting images. So simplifying our scenes can make a, such a strong impact on our travel photography. Uh, these are some images I pulled from the internet. Uh, as common errors that I see often in, in students where um, it is so easy to photograph people without looking behind them and seeing what's behind them that might interfere with them. So whether it's poles growing out of their heads or, you know, fountain making this woman look like she has a blowhole for a head or a giraffe growing out of a second giraffe, you know, all the things that are behind the subject uh, will distract from our subject. So subject placement is critical. So as much as we can kind of simplify our scene, uh, the more clear and impactful our images will be. So here's a quick example of an image in Japan, a beautiful young girl, uh, very quickly does this sweet little pose and uh, all around her, you know, this man's green, uh, this man's arm, this speaker, the sign, the car, all these distracting things are right behind her, this small girl that's going behind her. And it really takes you away from connecting to your subject. Um, and so to me, this is a, though this the subject is adorable, it's a failed image because of all the chaos behind her. And our, our human eyes have, we're naturally drawn to words and we're naturally drawn to icons like Nike symbols or, or whatever it is you can see on our shoes, Adidas symbols, we're drawn to these um, words and symbols and, and things we can recognize and those pull our eyes in certain ways. And so um, however we can eliminate those things, the better our portraiture will be. So uh, 
you know, coming more down to the child's level, you know, being eye to eye on them really helps us connect, moving your position so that your subject doesn't have, you know, garbage behind them, but has more interesting uh, subject matter behind them that maybe the subject can play off the background, considering light. Uh, whenever I'm taking a picture, I'll do a 360 check. So I'll I have a subject in mind, but I'll also check the peripheral of my image to make sure there's not any garbage that I don't want in that image. And by checking beforehand, I can reposition or um, you know, change my point of view, change how close I am to the subject. I can I can make sure that things that are distracting for the, from the subject aren't there. So eliminating unnecessary detail, that alone will strengthen your travel portraits. Um, there's always going to be garbage around your frame, and you as the photographer really do control what you include in your frame and what you uh, get rid of. And that's one of, one of the powerful parts of photography. So I think with, uh, with photographing portraiture, taking a storyteller's approach is one of the most powerful things you can do, because uh, people don't don't just exist in isolation. There's so much more information and, and detail, rich detail that you can draw from to take more impactful and interesting pictures. Uh, so we'll work through just um, an example in Greece. Uh, I was working with a group of young students, uh, maybe 14 to 18 year olds, and we had a, a field expedition day where we were on one of these boats uh, near Santorini, and you can see Santorini in the distance. And so trying to think of a storyteller um, and how I would take pictures as a storyteller, one of the first things I would want to do is get an image of the context. Where are we and what are we doing? And that way, when I show people, I can show, okay, this is what it looked like. This is what it felt like to be here. You know, you have a city in a distance and the most rich, beautiful blue water. And this is what the boat we were on was like. Um, and coming now, we're on the boat, and we have the boat's captain, a Greek man, uh, facing towards the light. And just we found our, our spot where the students are going to go swimming, and we've parked the boat. Um, and this is what you see from the boat. You see another boat, another people playing, kind of this is our view, this is our context. And the water is sparkling. Um, to get this beautiful, uh, I guess, starburst type, uh, you would shoot at, you know, F32 or F28, like a, a very closed down aperture. And the students started to jump into the water and started to play. And so I, I got up on the top of the boat to try to get different angles of this. Um, and I got to the point where I could photograph from the side, the students now jumping off the boat and kind of that story, those action shots of the story. So we're having, you know, a, con a context, an environment that the story is taking place in. We have the people that are involved. We have action shots. Um, and now we have another context pulled back. We're in this beautiful lagoon. Students are all swimming. Uh, the light is, you know, starting to come down. Um, and in the distance, there is a man, and um, this man is a very interesting man, and I learned about him as after I was photographing him. And he apparently is a hermit that lives in this little th uh, building here, uh, and the building at the top was also his, and he had this boat, and he just lived alone in isolation in this small lagoon. And so we have our students, they're swimming, they're enjoying themselves, uh, but there's these storytelling elements, there's these story points, these portraits that exist around. And so I kind of stayed with this person for a few moments and just watched what he did. Because um, it's interesting to think, you know, this is this person who's chosen to, to live away from others. And why, why is he here? And so really being led by curiosity um, and taking some interesting photographs of him and these signs that I still don't know what they say or or um, whatnot, but my idea is very much how can I take a beautiful image in this in this moment while while still working, while still traveling, while still doing other things. Um, and I ended up liking this one quite a lot 
because of the way the light was falling on him and because of the way the triangle formation of the, the building, the building and the sign. Um, so just an interesting kind of moment. And then you get pulled back into what you're doing and, you know, go visit the students and they're having a lovely time on, on the top. So kind of whenever you're in a position with your camera, looking around you and seeing what there's there's always so much there to photograph there's always so many stories going on around you and where can you pull in uh you know this is your main story but how do you where do you like you're pulling in side stories every everywhere you go this is the the joy of travel there's so much visual interest around you so um we talked a little bit about storytelling and we'll we'll dive in a little bit more now um, to how to tell a story instead of just taking a photograph of someone, how do we take a photograph about someone? So a photograph that is more authentic, more real, that tells us more about who this person is. Um, and we can do this in a few ways. And, and one of those ways is, you know, details. And another way is pull in contextual information. Um, and so we'll talk more about that because I think those are very, very important things to to do in your your own photography. Uh, so this is a uh, behind the scenes shot. So you kind of get a sense of the environment of a, a silk worker. And so he uh, thread by thread creates these really elegant silk crafts. Um, and uh, when you're in this environment, it's it's quite a messy environment, as I said. So honing in onto this this person and what they're doing, and their art or this craft is a very important thing. But then looking for those moments where someone is, um, you know, those small, those very 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 small details, the small smiles or the the focused. Um, the focus that someone could have while they're doing what they're doing, um, or that little that little um, twinkle in someone's eyes. I think those are very valuable things to really be attuned to when you photograph people. Uh, so as I said, uh, these particular men, they would weave thread by thread. And knowing that um, that's such an important part of this craft, how can I then photograph this craft? Um, so coming even closer, coming to get those very, very fine details will make these stronger pictures, but will help you tell a, a story about a person in a much more holistic way. And even seeing the threads, each thread is individually hand dyed. And so looking at the different color patterns and how, how much effort these people must put to make something so precise with so much care and so much dedication i think that shows so much about who they are and their characters so coming into these details pulling all the details of the story around you will make for such a stronger set of pictures uh, these details give clues about values about lifestyles about day-to-day -day routine and i i bet anyone who is watching can think of someone they know um, a friend, a family member, uh, someone you work with, and consider all the details that that person uh, has around them, whether it's their clothes or shoes or accessories or the way they style themselves, or maybe the objects in their possession. Is there anything that they really treasure or hold on to or hold sacred? Uh, if you look at someone's car, you know, that tells them so much about, it tells you so much about that person. Um, I have this strange habit when I'm tra traveling, if I'm on a bus, I will always photograph the bus driver's station because every country, country to country, it's, it's unique. It's, it's, you know, it's, it tells some, tells you something about that particular bus driver. So thinking about all the details that someone has about themselves, the belt buckles, the, it doesn't matter what it is. Those details really say a lot about the subject. Um, so how, how do you go about taking more images of those details? So you might take a, you know, a beautiful portrait of someone, um, but you might then, you know, say, I've noticed something about you. I've noticed your rings. I've noticed your bracelets. I've noticed this. Can I, can I please take a picture? And then, you know, come closer. 
use your feet, use your longer lenses, use a macro lens, use that. Um, if you're using your cell phone, there's your, uh, your tulip mode, your macro mode, essentially, in your cell phone uh, to get those detailed shots and let those details fill the frame. Uh, there often isn't a need to rush. We have more time with people than we think we do. Uh, you'll notice if someone's kind of getting frustrated with you or if you've overstayed your welcome and there's this fine balance of, you know, you don't want to push it because they've allowed you into their space, uh, but you you should, you know, stay there as much as they're comfortable with you staying there. So understand that you might have more time than you, than you feel like you have. Um, and so pulling in and seeing all of these details that people um like the the symbols of someone's characters through their art or through their dance or through their actions it's it's a really wonderful thing to pay attention to uh, so as i said i have this this strange need to photograph bus drivers little compartments and this one is such an example of such a beautifully organized person you know, the gloves are placed so neatly beside a hat, beside a, a sweat towel, and a little cup of pens so nicely organized. Um, so this, without a human in, involved, it tells us so much about the people that we are working with or that we are with. with. So those, though this is a picture of an animal, this idea of getting closer, the closer you get to something often, the more you can see. Uh, the more interest lies there. So as I said, ways to get closer, it's, you know, being patient, having that really warm, welcoming demeanor and a kind attitude, asking or using lenses in your favor, your longer lenses, your macro lenses, all those things can help you pull in and, you know, fill the frame with interesting details of your subject. And often with people photography, more than anything, gesture, expression and and quiet moments uh, are are vital you know if you can give people space and some quiet and some room and if they feel comfortable in your presence they're going to show who they are and they're going to show that through those small gestures and as long as you're attuned to them you can start paying attention to like start picking them up with your camera and so that really pushes that point of don't rush uh, because you will see so much more if you slow down and that's a, a general photography point uh, but with people that the natural instinct is to rush through but there's no need for that so we talk about coming closer and pulling in those details but then also pulling back getting further back and allowing um, our environment to tell us about the people that we're shooting, doing more of that environmental portraiture. Uh, the environment can say so much about place and time and about circumstance that that person finds themselves in and can really help us understand who the people we're photographing are, what kind of, uh, where do they live, where do they, um, you know their day-to-day -day routines how do how do they live their life this environment will say so much um so the question of the environment or context should always be fundamental when you're photographing people so question yourself do you make the environment port an important part of your portrait or do you often strip it away um, and hone in on the people can you do more of both can you sh can you take a great picture where you're you know you know connected very deeply to the subject and you're close but then also take some time and, and get that subject from further away um excuse me and so uh for whatever reason i absolutely love photographing surfers when i'm traveling i think they're a beautiful expression of freedom and play and um and so if I'm ever near water and they're surfers, I'll take the time to to photograph them. But then, you know, in your in your room or accommodations or wherever you are, if there's a view where you can get higher, you know, um, it's a strange travel tip. But if you book a, a hotel or a place that has a very, very high um, 
and it's a very tall building, you can get really interesting aerial perspectives that you wouldn't get had you not. And so always, um, I will always ride the elevator to the top floor or find the balconies or find the places removed from my room to see if there's a vantage point that shows me something interesting. Um, so pulling back, getting further, what can we add to our frame that help communicate what this subject is about? And so that tiny people in a big environment um, can really add scale, add perspective, add context. Um, and again, just this using the environment to showcase personality. These surfers, uh, you know, started midday and they they surfed until sundown and so I, I ended up capturing them the whole time that and so I have this story of you know when they started the light was a particular way bright sun whatever and then you have this entire entire story of of them surfing until uh, sundown so pulling back getting the environment is a is a quite a lovely thing to do and then sometimes you might hone in on a subject and get a shot that's you know just your subject, but you still want to have what the environment was like, what was this person looking at, where were we? And so you can juxtapose two different images, uh, the environment and the person together and still tell those details without necessarily having to capture it in one particular scene. So again, this storytelling idea, how do we tell someone's story? How do we capture these travel portraits? One question I'll always ask myself is, who or what else is involved in these pictures? And it's not just the person you're photographing, but what else around this person is involved? Uh, so as a small story, uh, we are traveling to a soy sauce master in a small uh, rural town in Japan uh, on one of the um, near Okinawa and one of the more southern islands, uh, traveling through these beautiful narrow passageways. And uh, we get to this place, and this is the soy sauce master, and he comes out very happy to see everyone. Uh, but I asked him, can I take a portrait of you? And um, the portrait in the, in the more center was how he stood as soon as he is our first portrait together. So he looked very uncomfortable. Um, we didn't have a language that we could share, um, but what I what I chose to do in that mo uh, in that moment was I motioned to another place that he could take a picture in. I didn't like the setting here. I thought the like it, it's not that visually appealing. Um, and one great tip for people portraits if if you can put someone in a garage or in um in an area where they're facing the light but behind them is dark it will be beautiful light on their face so i saw that he had a garage close by i kind of pulled him over towards that and um, you know tried to take a, a few more portraits where he was a little bit more comfortable a little bit less um you know tense and and tight um and we got closer there I, i'm not always a fan of the crossed arms, but he felt more comfortable there. And so that that's what worked with him. Uh, but who else is involved in this man's story? Who else works with him? What is he doing? What other elements can we draw in to tell a more whole story and to help us as photographers connect to the place we are? And so this man, he makes the most incredible soy sauce in all of Japan. Uh, and they do this special thing where they put the soy sauce on ice cream. And you'd think those two flavors don't really work well together, but it, it tastes like um, like on ice cream it's salty and in a really wonderful way and so they make it, it has become a delicacy there and so um how can i tell the story of this man's craft um and and you know all the different pieces of this story this you know someone taking this soy sauce that has taken so long to create and taking a piece of uh ice cream uh and then the the person who's eating and enjoying this um, result of his product. And so we're looking not only at, at what he is and what he's doing, but what he's made and who he affects. And so it's not just this one person, it's there's larger rings and larger circles that expand from this person. And then thinking always, what or who do these people care about? If you can get into that, 
uh, you're going to get a more more true images. Um, and so just just being with people, just seeing what they care for and how they express express that. Um, whether it's this man uh, and his chickens, or a young girl and a dog, uh, well, dog sledding on a on an expedition, um, or this young girl as we're passing, you know, this is a one second encounter. I saw a girl with a baby puppy, and she looked so happy. I haven't seen anyone being that much. Um, I, Cambodia, I think we were, and I I you know bent down. Uh, and I, I smiled at her and I, I took my camera and she had her puppy and she just held her puppy so proudly. Uh, and her mom was there and her family was there and they all uh, smiled and laughed. And then she kept walking. But there's this these moments of, you know, you can see that someone cares about something. How can you capture that? And, and again, I, I think I like dogs a lot. I think this is why there's a lot of these images in here. But uh, this dog sledding uh, man in Svalbard, um, and we, the group, we were all inside learning about polar bears and, uh, and then all of a sudden I, I look outside and I see him and I kind of run, not too close, he's having an intimate moment with his dog, but I run to capture this moment. And so always having your head on a swivel to see how people are interacting what, with what they love around you. Um, and, and you see it in their eyes, you see it in the small gestures. It's, it, these are not big, like it. It's a small, a small smile on the lip. It's these are very, very fine things, but those will help uh, your portraits just be outstanding. You know, catching catch lights in the eyes, that little twinkle that makes someone look more alive as they look towards the light, or all these little, little tiny things make your your portrait stand out that much more. Um, or start seeing dancers so involved in their dance that they're, you know. They're just they're just embodying that thing. Uh, they're they're expressing who they are through what they're doing. So we'll talk just briefly about uh, some technique, um, a little bit of the like uh, technical side of things. Um, a lot of photographers don't think as much about lens choice when it comes to portraiture, uh, unless they're doing portrait photography, but it makes such a profound, profound difference. Um, so here's an example of the same subject shot with two different types of lenses. On the left, you have your wide angle lens, and on the right, you have a telephoto lens. And so your wide angle lens will really accentuate um, the, like if you look at her nose on the left, it's much bigger, her lips are much larger, her face looks a little bit more narrow, but it's as though this the scene is expanding from front to back. So wide angle lens, ex, they expand the scene, whereas a telephoto lens, the photo on the right, will compress the scene. So her nose gets smaller, it gets compressed. Um, her, she's kind of, she looks more like how she would naturally. You've, I'm sure I've seen examples of pretty extreme wide angle lenses or uh, tell, and what are they called, fisheye lenses, where it's almost like this bulbous distortion of, of someone or a dog with a fisheye lens, how their snout will be so, so long. Um, so your choice of lens affects the appearance of your subject. Um, so much so that as we, you know, move in this day and age where we're taking selfies on our, on our, um, cell phones. Uh, the cell phones have more of a wide angle lens by default. And so our face on a cell phone isn't necessarily what we look like. And so we look at our cell phone pictures and like it, something doesn't seem right. Well, that's one of the reasons for that. Now, if you want to take better cell phone pictures, you can change your lenses and maybe go for a more telephoto lens to give you more of that flattering compression. Um, but here's here's this same thing, but more extreme. So on the uh, left most uh, top corner, you have your very, very telephoto lens and your right most bottom corner, you have your most wide angle lens in this circumstance. And you can see how much lens choice changes how her face looks. And it also changes how much of the background or the environment is included. 
So in the very telephoto lens, we're really narrowing it in. We don't have much of the background or the environment. We're kind of honing in on our subject. There's that compression I was talking about before. And on our very, very wide lens, your 19 millimeters uh, here, you have much more of the background included, but you see this distortion. You see this distortion on her uh, forehead, on her nose, on her mouth, on the shape of her face. This is not how her face looks. And so choosing a lens uh, with this distortion in mind can be an important consideration. Um, if you are using your cell phone, there is a portrait mode on all cell phones, uh, most cell phones nowadays. And your portrait mode, the idea behind this is that uh, your camera um, will uh, make the background blurry to emphasize your subject more. You'll get this nice bouquet, these little soft uh, out of focus pieces of light um, behind your subject and it will it will be a more pleasing flattering portrait so something to try if you've not tried i've, I've taken this image from the internet here um, but it is a, a nice demonstration the phones are now starting to you know take this in mind how do we take more pleasing portraits so portrait mode on your phone but some technical considerations uh, some great um, focal lengths for portrait photography. You're 50 if you want to include more of the details, more of the environment. 85 is beautiful. A 70 to 200 lens, one of my absolute favorites. Also really great for sports um, and action shots. So those would be my top three favorite portrait lenses. Uh, typically when you're shooting people, you might aim for shallow depth of field. So a more wide open aperture. This will blur the background, as I said before, bringing more of your attention on your subject. Uh, but if you are shooting groups of people, you want to increase your aperture to f5.6 to f11, depending on how many people. Uh, and that will ensure that every single person is in focus, if that is your intent. Um, and then also it's quite important if you're photographing a person that their eye is in sharp focus. So taking a moment to ensure their uh, your autofocus point is on an eye is a really great thing to do. Some new cameras have uh, eye tracking for wildlife. Um, and so that's a really nice feature in some newer cameras. Uh, and it was also, sorry, I was trying to remember this funny thing that I had learned many, many years ago. Uh, there was a portrait photographer teacher I had, and he had said that every single person has eyes of two different sizes. And so if you're taking a portrait of someone, you should, um, you should make their smaller eye closer to the camera so it appears bigger, and then their larger eye further away from the camera so it appears smaller so they look more symmetrical. And that was always a funny thing. Um, but I have remembered it since. But eyes are such a point of uh, connection with any portrait uh, and playing with the way in which people look at the camera or look away um, can be an interesting way to change what you're communicating. And so our final topic of today, uh, one of the most important, is light. And many, many photographers will say, you know, there is um, a, a time where you should be shooting portraits and a time where you shouldn't. Uh, and it's of my opinion that every single light will offer you something unique and there is no bad light. There's just better light for better uh, certain things. Uh, so I would definitely say shoot at all times. I definitely have my favorite light to shoot portraits at. I love that golden hour light um, when the sun is low in the sky and it's got a, a warm glow to it. I think it's it's really magnificent. Um, but I, I will often also shoot, you know, noon, uh, 12 noon when the sun, the sun is right above you and harsh and challenging to work with. All of the different lights that exist in the, in the world can lead to interesting images. So I'll give you just this one example and I'll talk about directionality of light and how you can use that to shape your portraits uh, for more impact. But here's a behind the scenes example. You know, crossing the street uh, again in Japan. Japan was a very recent trip for me, so that's why these images are so prolific at this point. 
Um, and I see, a, it, you can see it's a chaotic street, busy, busy, interesting light. Um, but this man in a motorbike, I see that the light is reflecting on his motorbike in an interesting way. And he stopped at the light and just about to make a right turn. And I know I don't have much time, but if he positions himself in a particular spot as he's driving by, the light is going to reflect on his face in an interesting way. And so I'm anticipating this happening. I think potentially there's a shot there just because of the way the light is interacting with his him. And so it's it's these are like small, small fractions of a second. But as you can see light in a, in a more like see light for its potential, you can then start to see where subjects, you know, come into the light or you start to anticipate your shots in a, a little bit more, um, a little bit more ahead. So we'll talk very briefly about the direction of light, um, where light comes from and how we can relate it to our subject's position. So typically there are um, five different positions you know the light can be behind your subject that's backlighting the light can be on the side of your subject that would be side lighting it can come in front of your subject that's known as front lighting um, it can come above your subject or below your subject and depending on the position of light your subject will will look different okay uh, it will really enhance mood or change the feeling of your images so backlighting often creates this beautiful uh, halo around your subject. It's soft, it's delicate. It has this nostalgic, more romantic feeling. Uh, you can bounce light back into your subject if you have um, a reflector, if you'd like to use one, or a white shirt or something along those lines. Uh, but this backlighting where the light is coming behind your subject can be really, really magical, especially when the sun is coming quite low. Uh, and so you see these bouquet, this is a really great example of the bouquet, those little out of focus dots of light. It has that warm, very expressive feeling. Front lighting is when the light comes in front of your subject, so it illuminates kind of um, the entire face. This can be so flattering uh, because you're not seeing, you know, heavy shadows under the eyes or under the nose or under the chin. Blemishes aren't emphasized by these shadows because there are few shadows very soft and delicate shadows if there are any there there really usually isn't um, so front lighting can be very very gentle oftentimes it's used to photograph women uh, models in in that uh, just for that little bit of twinkle uh, side lighting if this the light is coming in from the side of your subject Sometimes I will ask my subjects to face the light like a sunflower, just because uh, as your subject looks towards the light, it will put the light in their eyes. It will make them feel and look more alive. Um, so that's, here's what I've done for this person. Look, look to the window, look to the light. Uh, you're really starting to um, ex accentuate features in that way. And uh, really starting to see light in interesting ways will make your images that much stronger. And so one final thing that I love to do with uh, travel photography and travel portraits is if I ever see a nice piece of light or an interesting piece of light, this is you know noon in a, in a rundown area and there's just this bridge that had this narrow passage of light, I'll stay there and I'll see who passes and who comes into light and I'll expose for the subjects and let the shadow go into darkness. And this is more of um, a fisherman's approach. Sometimes you're hunting for your images and you're, you're actively pursuing them. And then sometimes you're just sitting and waiting and seeing what comes into your frame, you know? So uh, I know I'm a little bit uh, long, but in conclusion, you know, the human element of travel photography can be so enriching to your photographic practice. It can help you become a much better storyteller, a visual artist, uh, but it can really deepen your travel experiences and help you connect to the people and places around you. And I think that's the core of why we travel. I think we travel because we want to feel connected to the world around us and we want to really, um, you know, the surface level experiences, they're not enough 
spending time on the phone, it's not enough. We want to be engaged in the world and have these deep connections to what's around us. Um, so I hope you took one or two tips from this evening. And um, always when you consider your, your human element, striving for the authentic moments, for real emotion, for interesting action, and any kind of character revealing detail or environment. Thank you so much. Julia, thank you so much. That was such a comprehensive um, look at portraiture and I learned so much, thank you. And what amazing images. Um, we do have a bunch of questions, so we're just gonna try to hit a couple. Um, can you say more about how you get permission to take pictures? Um, when you do ask, do you offer money? Um, and how do you think about posting photos on Facebook or commercially publishing those photos? That's a really great question. Um, so a few parts to that question. Um, one of the things I'll do if I'm traveling with a group and if there's someone in that group that knows the people that I'm wanting to photograph, I'll, I'll talk to them first and I'll ask them, you know, are there any particular rules or restrictions or how should I navigate this situation, especially if it's in a culture or a place that I'm not yet familiar with. Um, and so having someone who is there who knows and who can help guide me um, to be respectful of another culture is really, really valuable. Uh, if I don't have someone else there to talk to, um, I, I will often ask if there's a language barrier, uh, you know, you're holding up your camera, you're smiling, uh, you're engaging in a conversation. Sometimes you go in cold and, you know, you you see something great and it's fast and you just go for your camera. And sometimes you have a chance to, you know, you see someone who is making something and you talk to them about what they're making and, and kind of spend some time before you ask for a picture. And that way they already get a sense of who you are. And, and that's a very different thing than, okay, now I wanna publish these images or now I want to use these images online. So typically I won't share as many of my travel portraiture uh, online on Instagram or, um, or whatnot. Uh, on my website I do, um, but if I'm looking for publication, then model releases become more of an important factor. And if that's the case, then maybe I'm, I'm having deeper conversations with the people that I'm, I'm photographing. I'll have a model release. Um, if I have that in my mind, I might have a model release form with me or depending on where you are, um, you'll have those conversations. Or sometimes even I'll get an email address of someone and I'll show them the picture that I've taken of them. Uh, and and then we'll say, can I email the, you this picture? Uh, and this is my intent is to publish or my intent is to use it in this way. And we'll have the conversation after the fact. So a few different ways to do it, but it really depends on, on the context. But above anything, being um, open about what you're doing and being respectful of others, I think is so, so key. Mm -hmm. um, how do you feel about editing photos, uh, for example, the grates in the background that are problem, you know, problematic for you, would you ever try to edit those out? Or do you feel like, oh, let's just keep it in, that was real? Yeah, uh, a half and half. Um, if I have time, I will edit it out if it drives me crazy. Those do, and I probably will. Um, but if it, it, if it is kind of integral to the scene, and if it, I think, I think, this boils down to intent. If I want maybe a more pristine image um, and I'm not caring about, you know, truth as much, it, it can be edited out and I don't mind doing that. But if it's more of like a, a journalistic documentary kind of thing, maybe I would change how I'm shooting it to get rid of that. Um, yeah. All right, let's finish with, and you did touch on this, but could you just remind us or expand upon your favorite equipment? Oh, yes. Whether you have special lenses you love, special, like do you use a monopod, any equipment that you feel is just essential? Oh, that's great. Um, so I do shoot right now with an R5, uh, Canon R5 mirrorless camera. I think it's a gem. Um, my favorite lens, probably of all times, uh, is a 70 to 200. And I like that lens um, for portraiture, 
and just general travel. I think it's it's lovely. It brings your subject closer to you. Um, it's just it's stunning. I know a lot of photographers who who will they don't love telephotos as much as I do. They love their wide angles, but I there's something so special about the 70 to 200. Um, but for portraiture, maybe my favorite is an 85 f 1.2. Um, and any other special equipment. Mm -hmm. So I don't typically shoot with tripod or monopod. I like to move quickly um, and I feel encumbered by them. And uh, sometimes on occasion, I might travel with a, a small light, not a, like on occasion, I'll, I'll use a, a speed light flash, but there's also a, a light um, and it's just a small little light where you can dial in um, the color temperature and the, um, I'm forgetting the name of it, but the intensity of the light and the color temperature. And if your subject's in a dark and gloomy environment, just having that continuous light source might help you out, uh, especially for indoors. Uh, with that said, I, I kind of hate being indoors. So I, as much as I can, I, I like to be outdoors. Well, thank you so much. That's the last uh, question we have time for today. So I'll turn it back to you for closing comments. I uh, just wanted to thank everyone who came out. Hopefully uh, you've learned one or two things that you can use in your own photographic practice. Um, but I really uh, encourage you to continue to look to the people in, in our travel photography, because I think it's uh, just one of the best parts of it all. Thank you so much. And thank you, Sunny. Thank you, everyone. Hope you have a great rest of your, your day and your week. Well, I, I just love that advice and want to echo what you said about the importance of, of making those human connections. It just gives the travel experience so much more meaning. So thank you for highlighting that. I want to thank everybody who tuned in today. Please join us again tomorrow for our next Daily Dose of Nature. You can check out this week's lineup, including registration links, on our website at nathab.com forward slash webinars. We did record today's presentation and we will have the replay available on our website soon. With that, we'll conclude the webinar. Have a wonderful day, everyone.